Good evening, everybody, and welcome to week two of BK141. Uh, you guys are going to have to excuse me tonight. I was kind of telling a couple of you I'm working through some bronchitis, so just bear with me and my trash voice tonight. But we've got a lot to cover. It's going to be a really, really fun week. Uh, we're getting into chocolate, right? Everybody excited for that? Uh, before we get into that, of course, I want to go over week one. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about, you know, successes, maybe any challenges had. Um, does anybody want to open up and, and talk about their experience with, you know, kind of that experiment with cooking that sugar syrup all the way through from your softball all the way up to your hard crack? How was that for you guys? I know before class started, Wendy, you were talking about that you uh, were going to make some strawberry lollipops this evening, that you, uh, you made some lollipops already, but you want to do some strawberry ones. Did anybody have any little fun things that they were making or you kind of just made, you know, cook the sugar through, but you didn't make any candies or anything with it? Hi, Chef. Sorry. Good, Monique. Um, so I just cooked mine, um, all the way through to caramel stage and made some caramel with mine, but I thought it was really interesting because, I mean, I've made many meringues with, um, cooked sugar and I've just never really ever paid attention to the sugar stages. I just cooked it to temperature and then used it how I was supposed to use it. And so it was really fun and interesting to see the different stages of cooking sugar. Um, yeah. Today I made some cold sugar actually at work. I was making a vegan meringue and then um, I did some spun sugar and then some sugar spirals around a pencil. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. those are fun yeah. to make. Yeah, it, it was, was super cool. cool. It was. I was like, oh my God, I just learned this yesterday. <laughs> like, Right? Isn't it so much fun when you like you learn that technique and it's like, oh, I'm legit now. Like this, you know, you feel yeah, so it was good. So fun. Yeah, my chef, my chef was laughing at me. She's like, You're such a nerd. Oh, <laughs> you're fine. No, I totally get it. I've been there. I get it. Um, but you know, it, it it's it's not often that you're going to be checking each stage, right? This is kind of one of those things where it's just not something that you really do. You know, you cook it straight to your softball and you use it, or you cook it straight to your hard crack and you use it. You never like take it all the way through and really see and get a look at the process. So I think this assignment is a lot of fun. Um, who was, somebody was else else about to say something? Was it? I think it was Sheena. Were you about to say something? No. Somebody had popped up at the same time um, that Monique did. No? Okay, well, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, just a couple things that I saw. I saw that you guys did a really nice job, uh, you know, laying everything out. It was a tricky week this week, you know, kind of moving as quickly as you could, right? Because the sugar syrup, it cooks fast. Um, but I saw that you did a really nice job presenting it. Uh, one thing I did notice was like softball um, through that hard ball stage, no crystallization. And then kind of as you hit uh, that soft crack, um, so a, a couple firm balls as well, that's when some crystallization started to kind of show up. Did anybody have that experience? Like as that sugar started, as your syrup started to become more saturated, um, that's when, you know, the crystallization started to kind of pop up there. Well, the reason that that's happening is a couple of reasons that it could be happening. Um, it could be because you're, um, you're agitating it too much. So as you're checking your samples, you might be like maybe mixing your syrup too much, or maybe as you're dipping your spoon and checking those samples, you might be introducing some crystals into it from that previous check. If it's starting to dry and then you stick it back in there, you might be setting off a chain reaction there. So uh, agitation is going to be something, <coughs> excuse me, that sets off your crystallization. Wendy, you said you didn't have any. Good, that's awesome. There were some really, really nice ones. Most of you guys did an awesome, awesome job. Um, 
And then the other thing that's going to happen is your, if you're taking too long, if your temperature on your stove is too low, then you're going to kind of see, I've found that you're going to see that crystallization kind of kick in if you're taking too long to go through the process and that it's just boiling and boiling and boiling, you're, you're more likely going to see that crystallization happen. So try to hit like a medium high, medium to medium high heat. Um, I know that with the nature of this experiment, you know, you have to kind of slow down to get each stage and to be able to show me. Uh, but when you are cooking sugar, you know, you want you want to have a higher heat, medium, medium, high heat. That way you're not like taking a really long time to go through the process, which is going to encourage crystallization to happen. So that was one um, thing that I did notice. Um, now I know Jean had reached out and she was asking about like food coloring and flavors. Uh, I think you did the banana, right? You did the banana one. Yeah, so with uh, there's a couple flavors that are pretty strong: banana, uh, peppermint, uh, rum. Any of those, like uh, rum extract, not real rum. Those ones you're gonna want to use sparingly. Um, also, you want to use it before it hits that caramel stage. You can flavor caramel, definitely can. But I find that there's some flavors that just don't like click with that caramel. So once you hit that kind of 280, 290. You could drop in your, um, if you're making hard candies, of course, you would want to drop your color in, drop your flavor in, and then that boiling, that process is what's going to disperse the color and the flavors throughout your syrup. Um, so you don't have to worry about stirring it, right? You don't want to agitate it too much. Mm -hmm. So at that like 290, you add in your, your, uh, your flavors, you add in your colors, and then by the time you're hitting that 300, pull it off the stove, and then there's no, you know, there's no coloring from the caramelization. So the color that you're dropping in is able to be in its pure pigment. Pigment. So Sheena, you did orange. If you're doing orange on top of a caramel, it's going to end up a lot darker than you might have wanted. So that's why you might not add, you know, some colors just, they just don't click. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't mesh well with that already natural um, amber in the caramel. Latricia, you had something to say? No. No? Okay. That's no problem. <laughs> I'm here trying to do this here, um, this sugary cookery. Yeah, you're doing you're doing that now. You're working on that now. Oh, awesome. Well, yeah. hopefully these tips and tricks are helping you get that sorted out right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like trying to measure this sugar. I'm like, oh my God, how many, how, how much sugar is that? I'm like, okay. 500 grams. You want to use 500 grams uh -huh. of sugar. So that's like two and a half cups of sugar, right? Yeah, about, yeah. Okay. okay. Right. I'm working on it right now and okay. I'm listening to you. <laughs> good. Okay, good. Um, Jean, let's see. You realize when you stuck the thermometer in, you realize what that, oh. what that? What happened was I was doing the, the stages and I was using the candy thermometer that we got with the school. Yeah. And then uh, like on my pictures, you, you said that mine started to caramelize. Mm -hmm. hot, and what I did is I, I have a digital thermometer and I stuck it in there and the temperature was higher on the digital thermometer than the candy thermometer. Okay. And I, I didn't realize it until later when I was watching YouTube videos how to uh, calibrate it. Yeah, it's a little tricky. I like to, um, I stick with digital. Like I love digital thermometers because I don't want to mess with the dial and trying to calibrate it. And then um, the candy ones, I just find them to be a little bulky for me. And I like the precision of the digital thermometer, especially when we're getting into chocolate. You're you, like, you gotta be precise, like really, really precise when you're, when you're tempering chocolate. Um, let's see, Carmen said she wanted to make coconut flavored caramel, but totally spaced on picking the flavors. I think sometimes that's like, the biggest thing we kind of get in our heads and it's like I want to do this I want to do that and then you kind of just like um, that becomes the biggest challenge not even like the, the work itself it's like well what should I make what should I make so just keep it simple in those instances you know I like to just keep it simple um, that way you can just really focus on on the actual like the sugar cookery and not worry so much about flavors there's plenty of time to get into all of that um, that's all I wanted to talk about for week one. Did anybody else have any other questions before, uh, before we get into week two? There's a lot to go over this week. No? Cool beans. All right, so chocolate. How exciting. I love chocolate. 
And it's one of my favorite things to work with. It's my absolute favorite thing to eat. It's my favorite food. Yes, it's food. Um, it's just, it's a really nice medium to work with. You can, you know, whether you're piping it, whether you're baking with it. Uh, of course, in this class, we're focusing on chocolate production. So we're going to be making, um, you know, we're going to be doing truffles next week. This week, we're really focusing on tempering chocolate and understanding Coverture, I know you've been hearing it since like 201, like, hey guys, you're gonna need Coverture chocolate for 141. What is it, chef? Well, we're gonna go over all of that. Um, so, I mean, before we kind of like dive into the assignment for the week, I just wanted to kind of go over a little bit about um, chocolate, you know, kind of the history of chocolate, the process of, of making it. Uh, let's pull this up. So a couple years ago, I think 2018, summer 2018, I got to go to a chocolate museum and it was so awesome. It took you through, like you started off, um, well, let me stop sharing real quick. You started like the first room that they took us in, it was like, uh, like taking us all the way back to, you know, kind of that Mesoamerican, all the Mayan and Aztecs. And they moved you room by room and showed you kind of, you know, the, the road that, that, um, that chocolate has taken from the beginning to, you know, what we know today. So I just wanted to share some of those pictures with you because it was so much fun. And uh, I thought that you would really enjoy kind of seeing it. So this picture I love because it breaks down and it shows you kind of like all what that cocoa bean is broken down into. So you've got your cocoa butter here. They had some beans that they showed us, um, cocoa butter, cocoa powder, and nibs, paste. I'll go over what all of these are, of course. Um, and then, so like, as you go through it, right, how cool is that? And so they had like different scenes, you know, so back in this time, what was happening uh, back here, switch over here real quick. I've got slides for that. Uh, so in the ancient time, there were, you know, some people will say, okay, well, you know, chocolate was kind of found by the Aztecs, but really it probably goes a little bit further back than that, believe it or not. It goes back to like the Olmec time, then to the Mayans, and then the Mayans kind of got wiped out, and then the Toltecs and Aztecs, then they took on, then it became, you know, like all through that time, um, it was used for medicine. It was used for trade, for currency. Um, it was just, it was a really, really important, uh, important bean, you know, for, for those people back then. Um, and then after that, let's go back to my museum. Can you guys see this? Is it sharing? Oh, there we go. Never mind. So then I, there was, I thought these were really pretty. So you know how, you know, people sit down and have like a cup of tea and they sit down for tea and they have tea sets. They had all kind of uh, drinking chocolate. So, you know, before chocolate was a confection, before people were eating it, they were drinking it. And these are some of the sets that they had there. You know, this is kind of, I think this is like the um, Versailles Palace of Versailles in France. This was like a scene from there and, you know, it was just consumed by the elite because it was really, really expensive. Uh, here's some like really old tools for producing chocolate. This one is the grinders. This is gonna grind the bean down. Uh, this one is like when you're making like jajes and things like that where you're coating your chocolate, you're gonna put it in here. That's all copper, 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 copper. And then I thought, here we go. This is an enrober. So, you know, like, have you seen, you know, those, um, like those Instagram videos and it's like going down the conveyor. Well, this is an old fashioned one. I always think of like, I love Lucy <laughs> when I see these. She's just gobbling up her chocolates. Uh, these I thought were really, really cool. So these are all made out of like modeling chocolate. How fantastic, right? This is my favorite one, Big Ben. I love Big Ben. <laughs> um, oh, and this one too. But yeah, so what they would do is you start with like a really big chunk of chocolate and you kind of just shave it down until you get um, those. There's some enrobed chocolates I bought at the end because I love chocolate. All right, so yes, uh, once it went from the ancients, then the Spanish came, right? So Christopher Columbus, they gave him some of these beans and he's like, what is this? I don't want it. 
So, you know, he didn't really like understand or have any respect. Gene, that was in um, Orlando. That's in Orlando, Florida. Um, I can't remember the road, but it's around like the Kissimmee area, like the Disney, uh, the Disney area. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't see your message. My screen was hiding. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Christopher Columbus, he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this stuff. He took it anyway. He was interested in it. He took it back to Spain. A few years later, Cortez shows up. The Aztecs think that he's a god, and he wasn't. He kind of destroyed them, but he took chocolate. He understood the value of it. He understood, you know, that this is something that he wanted to take back to Spain, and, you know, that's when the, uh, the cocoa started getting uh, cultivated throughout the Americas, throughout the Central Americas, throughout uh, the Caribbean. So it's kind of like that belt that goes around the globe, right? All around the equator. Because that's ideal temperature, that's ideal environment for cocoa beans. Cocoa beans and coffee beans, they have a lot in common. The environment that they need, um, it needs to be humid. The trees, it needs to be really shady. So that whole like band around the globe, around the world, that's where cocoa beans are going to grow. Uh, once, you know, once it kind of, the, the trade started to expand, other countries started getting involved, and then it kind of gradually made its way, the cocoa beans made their way to Africa, to Southeast Asia, and just all around that, that area. So now, you know, when you see certain chocolates in a cycle, single origin blend, um, it's coming from these different countries different terroirs, so they have different flavors, different nuances, depending on where they come from. And that's kind of how that expanded um, like that. Um, so we kind of fast forward to uh, the Dutch, uh, one of a Dutch chemist, or sorry, a Dutch inventor, he created the hydraulic press in the 1800s. Now this really changed things for chocolate because now you could separate the cocoa butter from the cocoa itself. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so up until now, you know, you just kind of grind it down and they would make like a really bitter drink out of it. It wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. I tried it, trust me. <laughs> it wasn't good. But it would get like flavored with uh, maybe vanilla and things like that. Um, but yeah, so once, um, once the hydraulic press was created and they were able to split that cocoa butter from the cocoa liqueur or liquor, which is the paste just ground down. There's no alcohol in there. It's just the name of it. Um, and then he took that powder and then alkalized it. So that's where we get our Dutch process. That's why it's called Dutch process uh, cocoa powder uh, is because it's been alkalized. It darkens the color and it lightens the flavor a little bit. And then some English guys, whether it's Cadbury or Fry, that's the debate of who went ahead and started buying this type of chocolate from um, Conrad. And uh, at that point is when it started to become a confection. Um, so, you know, up until then, it was, it was solely a drink. People weren't eating it. It wasn't until um, it was then realized that you could kind of add that cocoa butter back to the cocoa solids with the sugar, and then it sets and it gets hard and hey, it kind of tastes good. So now we kind of start moving into eating chocolate. Um, and then the conching uh, process was created. So this is where we get a really good consistency. This is where we get really good texture. So before they were just kind of doing it by hand, but then, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> when we get over here to the Swiss. So I love Swiss chocolate from Switzerland. That's like my all time favorite chocolate to eat. Uh, it would, they created milk chocolate. They then added milk solids into the chocolate and uh, which um, Nestle, Nestle created that milk powder. And then Daniel went ahead and put it into some chocolate and created milk chocolate. Um, lint, we all know lint, you guys heard of lint, right? Uh, so lint created the conjuring process. And what that process is, is at the end of here. So this is bean to bar, it gets, the beans get harvested first. They get fermented, right? They just kind of go in banana leaves out in the sun. It ferments them. It changes the flavor and stuff. Uh, it starts to dry them out. Uh, then they get clean and roasted. Once they've been roasted, shells come off, and then that's where you have nibs. Have you guys had nibs before? Chocolate nibs or cocoa nibs? 
Yes, th- I love them. Yeah, right. They add such a nice like uh, texture to desserts. They add a good little bitterness, a little bit of crunch, and uh, it's just a really nice garnish. It's simple, but it adds an extra element that just it works so well. So that's all the cocoa nib is. Is once the cocoa beans have been uh, roasted, you snap those shells off, and inside that's where you get the cocoa nibs. Now those cocoa nibs are made up of about 50% cocoa butter. So then that's where that hydraulic press comes into play, splashes those cocoa nibs down, and then that's where it splits into your powder and your cocoa butter. <clears throat> All right, so when you get to that conching stage now, that's when sugar gets added to your cocoa solids, and then you're going to pour in, you know, depending on how much um, cocoa butter is needed, remember coverture chocolate is going to be a minimum 31% cocoa butter. So that cocoa butter gets added back in, it grinds for hours, sometimes days, until it reaches that super, super smooth consistency. Um, And that's, you know, at that point, that's when it goes to your chocolatiers, us, and uh, we start creating delicious chocolates out of it. So I just wanted to go through that just so that you guys, you know, I, I'm really interested in that kind of stuff, kind of, you know, all the nerdy geeky stuff about chocolate. <laughs> I just wanted to share that before we get into like tempering and everything. Um, Ronald said he loves Milka bars. I adore Milka bars. Love Milka. Um, one of my favorite kind of manufacturers is Falkland. They're Swiss, they don't, they're not retail. They don't have any chocolate retail, unfortunately. Um, but like, I fell in love with that chocolate, so delicious. Um, what else, what else, Calibo, Calibo, well, Calibo's Belgium, but I love it. I love all of that chocolate. Um, some other Curvature brands, I saw you guys were sending me, you were working with, um, I saw a lot of Calibo. Did anybody get Valrona for your Curvature? Anybody spending the big bucks? Too expensive, yes, Wendy. So I said, anybody spending the big bucks on Valrona? So Valrona comes from France. Um, in the States, we've got Guitard and we have Ghirardelli. Uh, so Ghirardelli, they've been in the game with chocolate kind of way back when, you know, chocolate was like coming into uh, the confection world. Um, we have uh, Hershey, right? Hershey's on the, on the East Coast. And then we've got Ghirardelli on the West Coast. And those are the big powerhouses in the in the Americas for chocolate. Uh, Wendy might get some on Friday. Let's see. Sheena said she's looking at the chocolate trading company website. Oh yeah, there's always really good deals. You can definitely find a lot of good deals if you search around the web long enough. <clears throat> so this week, let me pull this up. All right. So this week, what you guys are going to be doing is either dark chocolate, milk chocolate, or white chocolate whichever one you want, uh, you're going to be tempering. Now, what is tempering, chef? Tempering chocolate is basically you are taking your chocolate through a range of temperatures to introduce a staple crystal. Uh, Basically, what we're working with is, hold on. All right, so what we're really tempering is the cocoa butter. It's the cocoa butter that we need to get under control. So that cocoa butter has uh, six different crystal forms in it. The one that we're going after is form five or your beta crystals. Those are the most stable. They've got a higher melting point, um, but not like so like too, too high. Um, Whereas kind of your crystals one through four, they're gonna have lower melting points. um, And they're just, they're not stable. They're not gonna produce what we look for. We look for the three S's when we're tempering chocolate. The three S's are set, snap, and shine. Some people will say strength, strength or set. Basically what we're looking for is it should be glossy. There shouldn't be any bloom. There shouldn't be any streaking going on. So here I brought up this picture. You can see the difference in the two of them where this one's super glossy and this one has all this like funky gray stuff going on with it. There's a couple different types of bloom actually. There is a bloom that, There's bloom that is from humidity. So your humidity bloom is going to be, what happens are the sugars start to come to the surface. And then when the, uh, when the moisture hits it, they start to dissolve and then it recrystallizes. And then you just get a really brittle, 
it's just gross, all right? You can't, sugar um, humidity bloom is gonna be a lot more damaging than the other type of bloom, which is gonna be from heat. Now heat bloom, basically what's happening is it's melting, your chocolate is melting. So what happens is the, the cocoa butter comes to the surface and recrystallizes on the surface. It's ugly and you can't use it for dipping at that point, but you can still use it in ganache. You can use it to bake with. So you don't have to throw away, if it's just a little kind of white and dusty on the outside, use it for other things. Just don't use it for like uh, tempered chocolate purposes. Um, let's see. Let's go ahead and pull up, give me one second, just closed it. I wanna go ahead and pull up this week's assignment and that way you can see that. <clears throat> All right, so this week what you're gonna be doing is you're going to be tempering 500 grams, same as your sugar. You're gonna be tempering your chocolate, whichever one you chose. You're going to show me uh, your self ID, mise en place. You're going to show me your um, properly folded cornet bag, which we will go over how to make that. And then uh, some patterns piped out. And then, of course, uh, your finished product. And uh, here you're going to, as far as the, the chocolate itself, you want to show me before you've tempered it and once it's set, once it's actually tempered. All right, so I have also like a guideline, you know, so that you know what temperatures you're looking for. So when you're tempering chocolate, you're not only focusing on the temperature, you're also focusing on agitation, temperature, and time. Those are all really, really important to tempering chocolate. So everything kind of plays a role. And there's actually like kind of some talk, you know, in, in the industry of, well, is it an outdated term? You know, if you're not only focusing on temperature, should it still be referred to as tempering? But I think collectively, you know, everybody kind of just knows that when you're tempering, all those other factors come into play. Um, so, I mean, I don't see anybody starting to call it anything different anytime soon. <laughs> but what you're gonna be doing is you're going to melt your chocolate down. Now I've given you here, I'll put this up on the class page as well, uh, but I've given you your melting temperature, your cooling temperature, and your rewarming temperature. So what you're doing is you're going to go ahead and melt your chocolate down to about 100. If, if you're working with dark chocolate, it works the same for each one, but I'm just going to go through the dark chocolate. So you melt your chocolate down and until the 115. Now something that I like to do is once I've scaled out my chocolate, I'm going to set only two thirds of my chocolate. It doesn't have to be exact. If you want to do exact 150 and 250, um, you're going to put two thirds of your chocolate into a bowl. Set that on top of your bain marie because you're going to be melting down with the bain marie, right? We mean indirect heat because chocolate is really delicate. You're going to melt that until it gets to about 115. You don't want to touch it. Just leave it there, let it melt. Once you start to see around the edge is starting to melt down, it probably looks a good bit of your chocolate has melted, then go ahead and give it a stir. Chocolate likes to be agitated because you want to make sure that all of the crystals in there are, are getting evenly dispersed. Um, so once you have it completely melted, it hasn't gone over 115, you're going to go ahead and take it off the heat. You want to set it on like a... Um, like a towel would be fine, just like a hand towel or something, just so that um, it's not sliding around everywhere. You know, you want to wipe off the bottom of the bowl so there's no extra moisture. And then at that point, you're just going to continue to stir it until it cools down to um, that 80 to 84. Now, as you're stirring, remember that other third of chocolate that we had? You're going to start to feed that in. Now, this is called the seeding method. So, what you're doing is you are introducing already stable chocolate. When you get your chocolate, it's tempered. It's tempered, it's ready to go, it's in temper. But once you melt it, that's what throws it out of temper. So when you add that seed back in, you're introducing the stable crystals to allow your chocolate, your melted chocolate to come down in, in temperature and also to have those stable crystals added to it. 
Now, once it's completely cooled down to that like 80 to 84 degrees, it's going to be pretty thick. You can't really work with it at that point. So then that's when that rewarming stage kicks in and you want to rewarm it to around like for uh, dark chocolate, it would be like 88 to 90 degrees is a good warming temperature, a rewarming temperature. At that point, it's going to have some pretty good viscosity. You're going to be able to um, dip your truffles. You know, you can enrobe uh, your chocolates. You can fill your chocolate molds. Um, you'll be able to, you know, do some, some piping work. So that's why we want to rewarm that. Whether you're doing dark chocolate, milk chocolate, or white chocolate, it's the same process. You just want to work with whatever the correct temperatures are, which, like I said, I'll put that guideline for you on the class page. That way you know what to look for. It is in the reading, it's in chapter uh, chapter 24, um, but I'll just, I wanna make sure that you guys have that chart um, easily accessible. Um, before I keep going, as far as the tempering itself, there are other methods, but the easiest one that you guys are, wanna, are gonna want to do is the seeding. Um, did anybody, was anybody interested in doing the tabling? Does anybody have any like granite or marble around the house? Well, just in case. Have, you do, Diva? Who else? Wendy? I have yeah. a marble cutting board. But oh, I, nice. It's like, I use it like for decoration, but it's always cold. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had that. So if you're doing the tabling method, what you're doing there is your chocolate is going on to your your marble board or whatever it is something that's cool not too cold though because you don't want to um you don't want that that uh, change in temperature it's going to kind of seize up your chocolate um so basically what you do is you you're pouring your chocolate out onto your board and then you're you can use a spatula I use like, you know, those painters, like palette knives. I don't know if they're painters, but something like that. They sell them for chocolate, but you can grab them at a hardware store, like Home Depot or whatever, a uh, palette knife. And you're, you're pushing it along that marble to cool it down. And then once it's gotten to that thicker, you know, that thicker uh, uh, consistency, that thicker texture, you know, of course, check it with your temperature as well then you're going to put that back in your bowl and rewarm that to your working. So instead of introducing the stable crystals, what you're doing is you're doing the whole thing on the board. Um, you can also do that in an ice bowl. It's quick, but it's not, it's not the best, the best one. It's not the best option because what you do instead of using the table, um, you set your bowl of chocolate in an ice bowl, but there is potential for water to get in your chocolate, and right, we know water is going to seize your chocolate, and you don't want that. Um, but it's it's a quick way, you know. You just keep mixing it, and it cools it down really, really quickly. Um, but you don't get as nice of a shine doing that way either. Uh, there's also the microwave method, where by like every 30 seconds, 30 second increments, you're melting that chocolate down, and once it hits that warming, that uh, working temperature, then you immediately work with it. Um, I don't really ever work with microwaves, so it's not one that I use a lot. Like, I don't even own a microwave, but it's definitely another option for tempering. So there's different options there. Um, I think that this the seeding method is probably going to be your best bet. I think that's the most kind of comfortable one to get into. It's the least messy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's uh, definitely going to be one of your more comfortable methods to get into. Um, let's see. Once we get it tempered, can we hold it in a chocolate warmer? So you can. Does your chocolate warmer have uh, specific temperature controls on it? Or is it just low, medium, high? It just has low, medium, or high. I would probably steer away from it then, um, just because it's you don't have full control over what the temperature is. But they do, like if you're working in a chocolate shop, there are warmers there that are keeping their chocolate tempered. You know, when you're working like larger scale, it's impossible to like, you know, keep that chocolate at working temperature the whole time when you're making all these big batches of stuff, right? So they have, uh, they have warmers, they have equipment that's going to keep the chocolate at working temperature, but it keeps it consistent. It's set to 88 degrees and the chocolate doesn't move from that temperature. Does that make sense? Um, uh, is that 
the one for ganashing a cake. So when you're gonna do a ganache and a cake, you're using just a ganache, that's it. So you uh, milk, chocolate, melt that together, and then that's what gets poured over your cake and it glazes over the cake. Uh, tempered chocolate is going to set hard. So <clears throat> a cake that has ganache over it, you know, it's still really soft. That wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be the tempered chocolate. That's not what we do there. Any other tempering questions? No. 500 grams is just, it's a good weight because if you try to temper, temper too little um, volume, if you try to do too little of a weight, uh, it's just, it's more difficult to temper it. It's going to be a lot easier when you have a bit more. If you wanted to do more, you can do more. That's fine. Um, but I definitely wouldn't go less than that just because the less, like the less chocolate you have, it's going to fall out of temper quicker. Um, that heat is going to escape from it a lot quicker. So it's going to be hard to keep it at that working temperature if you're only working uh, with a little bit. All right, so I pulled up some uh, some examples of some things that you guys could be piping out this week. I liked this one here. And there's on the class page too, there's a couple videos, sit and watch those. There's one that shows you how to do different uh, decorations. And then the other video is that tempering video where you can sit and watch like the whole process. Um, so here, these are some chocolate curls they're using acetate. Now acetate is going to give your chocolate a really, really lovely shine. Um, the chocolate peels away from it very easily. It, it creates, like I said, that shiny surface. So what you would, how you would do that is you spread your chocolate on there with a comb. You kind of curl it up, which it shows you in the video. And then once the chocolate is set, you just pop it off the acetate. It's got these really, really pretty curls there. Another one that I love are these petals. So basically what you do there is you take a piece of parchment and you like drop little dollops, drop little dollops of, um, <clears throat> you drop little dollops of your chocolate and then you can just take the back of a spoon and put it in there and pull it down. Or you can use a knife. You can press a knife and pull it back and then you curve it over a rolling pin and it makes these really cool petals. I thought that those were really pretty. This chocolate sphere here, if you guys have like a, like a silicone dome or something like that, I know in the discussion forum, you guys were really into like the, the sugar bowls with the balloons and stuff. Those are really cool. But you can also use, um, you can use the silicone domes. You fill it, you fill uh, the dome with the chocolate and then you turn it, um, you invert it so that the extra chocolate can drip down or you can just use a pastry brush and then just brush the inside of it, coat it with chocolate. Once it's set, you pop it out and you heat up the back of the tips and then you just kind of like pop the holes out of it. It's really cool. It's a fun one to do. Does anybody have any ideas of like different decorations that they're wanting to do this week? Leaves. Oh, nice. Yeah. Not yet, Wendy said. Monique, the transfer sheets did you get? Are they plain? Are they um, they're plain ones? You got acetate sheets, or you got like the transfer ones with the decorations? Or are you gonna paint it yourself? No, I actually got the transfer sheets with the decorations. Nice, yeah, because you can you can get the plain ones, and you get cocoa uh, cocoa butter colors, and you can create your own transfer sheets. It's really cool. Actually, one of my favorite books I've got right here. It's huge. It's like a hundred pounds. Oh gosh, this guy. This is like my favorite book right now. Um, so Jean-Pierre Weibel, he uh, created transfer sheets. He's he's the guy who made those. So it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, what else, what else? Oh, I wanna show you guys before we, before we break away, I wanna show you guys some uh, cornets. Has anybody made, you know, the paper cones? Has anybody made those before? Steph, Sinead, when you get a chance, I need to ask a question about this tonight assignment that's due. Okay. Um, 
Hold on one second. You can, I'll, um, you can um, message me after class and then I'll, get, I'll touch base with you that way. We can sort you out, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay. All right, so let's see. Diva's made some cornets before. So this is those little paper cones. I used to be the guy making them at work all the time. I think they're a lot of fun to make personally. I, I really enjoy making them. Um, but what you're doing here is you basically have, that's not the picture I wanted. All right, so you have your uh, triangle like this, right? Then what you do is you turn that corner in and just, here it has it numbered, one, two, three. So you wanna take one over to two, but you tuck it like under itself. And here is an example of that. So they took it up this corner, brought it down here, but tucked it under, and then they continue rolling it until it gets to that last corner. So that's how you do that one. And I, um, I have a little video <clears throat> that I'm gonna put up on the class page to show you guys how to make that too. Cause that's one of those that like, you have to do it a couple times to get it. I remember when I was learning how to make them, I was like, I can't, I can't understand how to fold this thing. But you do it a couple tries and you'll totally get it. Uh, Monique, they're a pain, but your manager makes you use them. They're, I love them. I love using them for chocolate work, um, for royal icing as well. Yes, Julia Usher is the best. She's amazing. But they're just, they're really good for fine details. So you kind of, you know, you, you don't want like this big, giant, bulky bag when you're working with, you know, this tiny little bit of chocolate and you're piping out these little, um, you know, these little appliques and you're writing happy anniversary 10,000 times on your plates. You don't want to have this big old bag. It allows you to have just like what you need to work with. Um, and I like the grip on them too. The plastic is too like slippery. Um, let's see. They are hard to learn. They are. They are very tricky to learn. Um, you guys are going to like my video. The way that I learned, we, we call it uh, ugly fin always turns in. So you guys will get it when you see the video, but it, it helps it stick. You know, those stupid little songs, they are, they're so good for learning things. Um, Let's see, a way I don't have to use all my piping bags. Yeah, Wendy, it's it's really nice. You know, you can just like pull your sheet of parchment, cut off your triangle, and you can make them in advance. You can just like have a whole like stack of them ready to go. So that's always the good thing about those. Um, let's take a look at what's due this week. I wanna make sure that you guys know what I need from you. Uh, so this week we've got a knowledge check and conversion check again. Remember those are due on Tuesday. 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, you're, you have a discussion form again as well. This week's discussion form is asking um, what chocolate did you decide to use? How was your experience? So this one you're going to need to do your production before you are answering your questions. So make sure you get going on your production ASAP. Um, you wanna have that initial post due by like Saturday night just to give everybody a chance to be able to respond. Um, I'm still going through the, the discussion forms for week one as well. So if yours hasn't been fully graded yet, no worries, I'm still going through uh, those, um, as well as of course, tonight your, your week one assignment is due um, and I'll be working on grading those over the next couple of days. Um, and then your chocolate production. So showing me your, uh, your tempered chocolate. I wanna see it before it's, um, I, I want to see it when it's melted and then I want to see it once it's tempered. You can put it on like a piece of parchment and then kind of like tilt it. That way I can see that it's shiny. You can even once it's set, snap it for me because I want to see that, you know, that set, snap and shine. Um, and then I also would like to see your paper bag and any little decorations. You can practice writing, happy anniversary, happy birthday, um, happy, was it happy anniversary, happy birthday, and congratulations are the three that you're gonna use the most. Um, so you can practice writing those. Um, storing leftover chocolate, great question, yes. So you can totally store this for next week's production. All you're gonna do, once it's melted down, um, get a sheet tray and put um, put parchment on that sheet tray. 
and then you're going to pour your chocolate onto it and you're going to once it's set then you can just wrap it up um, you can also like as long as your chocolate has cooled enough you can use uh, you can use cling wrap to do that as well but I just I like to use parchment for like everything and anything that I can um, so yeah just pour it on the parchment let it set and then wrap it and then wrap all of that in your cling wrap that way no moisture and stuff is getting to it leave it uh, room temperature do not store it in your fridge it's a little bit too cold for chocolate uh, chocolate does best between like like 50 to 60 just a little bit over that refrigerator temperature kind of like that 60 degree mark is, is really good for storing um, for storing your chocolate uh, Wendy said it's a boy is another one yeah it's a boy um, it's you know it's a girl any celebration little term uh you're going to write those a lot if you're working in a resort if you're working at a restaurant because people are going to want it written on their on their plate when you take out their dessert um i think that we've gone over everything i wanted to go over what questions do we still have out there for for week two Can we make chocolate bars? You can, you can pour, um, well, wait until next week. Wait until next week for that, just because I want you to hold this week's chocolate for next week, because next week we're doing truffles. Um, you're going to be making a ganache. You're going to be dipping your truffle, your truffles. You're gonna be dipping your truffles in your chocolate, in your tempered chocolate. So save that for next week. Um, chocolate's expensive. I want to make sure that you guys, you know, can use it this week and next week as well. Any other questions before we part, please? Hopefully your kids don't need it, right? Keep off. Say, stay away. Mama needs this for school. Whatever you got to say. Well, guys, it was a pleasure hanging out with you tonight, talking about chocolate. You know, you can shoot me a text, you can give me a call, send me a message on Moodle, whatever you need to do. Um, with any questions, please, please, please. I know that tempering chocolate, it's a little tricky and I wanna help you however I can. So get those questions to me. Uh, make sure that you are finishing up week one um, with your, your sugar cookery if you haven't. Latricia, I'm gonna reach out to you after class. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it guys. Uh, well, what uh, Ronald said he's worried about his wife. Yeah, I would be worried too. <laughs> well, guys, I hope you have a really good night. It's been a blast and I will see you later. See you later.